Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. I'm so excited that you're here. My name is Nathan Hill. Uh, I'm the marketing director here at Next After, and today we're talking about how to supercharge your year-end fundraising. We'll certainly have some more people joining us here in the next few minutes. I think a text message reminder just went out to many of you. Um, but thank you for being here. It's not lost on me how much time and effort it takes uh, to spend time even now in one of the busiest seasons of the year to focus on learning and how you can actually grow your fundraising. So we're going to try to make the most of every minute of your time. Uh, as you see, if you're just joining, there's lots of people sounding off in the chat box on the right side of your screen, letting us know who they are, what organization they work for, and where in the world you're tuning in from. from so feel free to use that. I'd love to see you know, the names and, and uh, organizations of everyone joining. It's a lot of fun. Some shout outs here to Rita and Joanne, the first ones to join, Lori, Melinda. We've got people from all across the country, it looks like. I know we always have a pretty good uh, uh, Canadian regiment as well, too. Uh, so welcome, everyone. Excited that you're here. Uh, hopefully, we can give you some great ideas to boost your year-end fundraising. Now, a few things, a few housekeeping items before we dive in. Number one, the most popular question we always get is, is there a recording available of this webinar? The answer is yes. So we are going to start recording this webinar here in just a moment. And I will send you links to the recording. I'll send you links to the slide deck. I'll send you links to any resources that we mentioned in the email around 5 p.m. this evening, 5 p.m. Central Time. That is. So be on the lookout for that. If you miss something and you want to go back and rewatch it, you'll have the video to do that. Or you can share it with a colleague who might also be interested in some of the ideas that Greg's going to share. Now, throughout the presentation today, uh, questions may come up. You may want to dive deeper into a specific experiment or idea that Greg shares. And we do have some time for Q&A at the end. So use that same chat box that looks like Randy just used to tell us where he's tuning in from, from Franklin, Tennessee. Use that same chat box to let us know what your questions are throughout the presentation. I'm going to be watching those. I'm going to take some notes on those questions coming in. And then we'll revisit those with Greg at the very end as we have time for it. So feel free to ask any and all questions. Now, if this is your first time joining a Next After webinar, or maybe this is your first introduction to Next After and Next After Institute, our mission here at the Next After Institute specifically is, is to decode what works in online fundraising and make it as accessible to you and other fundraisers and other organizations as much as is possible. We want to equip you with what we're learning can actually work to inspire greater generosity. So that's our mission. The primary way that we do that is we conduct research, two kinds of research. Uh, forensic research is where we go out into the marketplace and maybe we'll give 100 or donations to 150 organizations and look at you know, how do they structure their donation page or what do they do with their email follow-up communication or how do they acquire recurring donors online. And we'll document that in research studies. And it generates new ideas that we can then test, which is our other type of research. So we work with nonprofits uh, that we consult with to test these ideas to see what actually works using data, using testing, using statistics to prove what works to increase giving. From that research, we produce resources like eBooks and, and, and webinars like this one and podcasts and templates and lots of different resources for you, as well as some higher level uh, training courses, certification level training, we have a conference and lots of different things. So uh, that's where all this is coming from. It's not just a, coming from a position of like best practices and gut feelings and instincts. Everything that you're gonna hear today is based on data. It's based on what we've learned through testing and through practical application can actually lead to more revenue. You may see examples from all across the spectrum of ideology and, and uh, different verticals and different types of causes and different nonprofits. Uh, maybe the specific case study isn't exactly like your cause, but there's learnings in there that can be applied to you and your organization and your context. Uh, today's speaker is Greg Kalunga. Oftentimes, I might teach some of these. Brady might teach some of these if you've been on these before. But Greg is someone who's actually in the weeds, working with organizations every single day to execute on these types of campaigns. I know yesterday he was very busy with Giving Tuesday. Lots of different organizations trying to raise money on Giving Tuesday. Hopefully, you were too. And hopefully, you saw some success yesterday as well. Greg's our executive vice president. Uh, and he has some really interesting perspective and insights and ideas for you today. Now. <clears throat> Uh, we've been lucky enough at our office to you know, have enough space to, to distance over the past few months and still have opportunity to kind of be at our, at our desks and in the office as much as is possible. Uh, but we actually had our, had our first case uh, just this past weekend of an employee. So we're all back at home. We're remote. Uh, and because of that, we're coming to you. We're, I'm giving this presentation to you uh, pre-recorded. I'm live right now, but we've pre-recorded with Greg just because he's got kids that are also doing virtual school and all that. And we wanted to make sure it's a quality presentation for you and not have any uh, 
know, ups and downs with internet access and all of that. So in a, a moment, I'm going to actually play the presentation for you, play the webinar for you, but Greg will be back on at the end of it for that live Q&A that I mentioned. So bear with me here for a moment while I transition and actually start this presentation for you. I've got to stop sharing my screen and then start sharing the video. So we'll be live with Greg here, well, pre-recorded with Greg here in just a moment. Hey guys, thanks for uh, joining us today. Appreciate uh, you being with us. Today we're gonna look at uh, how to supercharge your year-end fundraising. So uh, I always like to start uh, all of these conversations with what it is that we're trying to accomplish today. And, and really there's, there's kind of four things that I'm hoping to accomplish uh, with this presentation and, and with you all today. Uh, so let's just go through those. So the first thing that I wanna do is Make sure that we have an opportunity to um, just talk about uh, a few quick tips on your value proposition. I think um, I have some experiments to show, uh, and we'll get into it in just a moment. But if you if you don't have your value proposition right, um, then the rest of your campaign is probably not going to be very good. And so, uh, this is the first and most important place to focus. Uh, so I'll break down some of those components and give you uh, a little overview. Uh, or maybe a reminder uh, around what the value proposition is, what the components of it are, and um, how you can make sure that that is uh, your first and most important focus uh, to supercharge your year-end fundraising. And then uh, right after that, I wanted to make sure that we talked about something that your campaign might be completely missing. And uh, moreover, some opportunities on uh, how you might be able to uh, account for this or create uh, an answer to this if it is indeed missing. And then uh, right after that, we'll talk about uh, three ways that you can make the most out of your existing web traffic, specifically on your website to extend the reach to your ex existing known audiences um, and get them to consider participating in your year end campaign. And uh, the fourth and final thing that we'll look at today are uh, four different ideas to jolt your campaign, uh, specifically with paid advertising. So um, with that being said, I think we'll jump right in and we'll talk about quick tips on your value proposition. So uh, if you've been uh, a fan or a follower of Next After for any amount of time, you probably heard us talk a lot about the value proposition. Uh, this is the foundation by which uh, your campaign and uh, your overall, your fundraising effectiveness is going to um, spring forth from. And so uh, we really want to make sure that we touch on this. And really there are four components to the value proposition um, that, that can help you, or, or in terms of like thinking about your value proposition, there are four kind of categorical ways uh, that you can do that. And so the first is appeal. And we typically say like, I like it, I want it. Um, and, and appeal really comes down to um, you know, how interested uh, the audience uh, is to the call to action that you are communicating. And, uh, you know, your perceived assumption about, um, you know, how interesting it is or, or how, how much you think they might want it. And of course, there's some things that you can do to kind of test that. But ultimately, uh, appeal is one of the most important components um, of the value proposition. The next is exclusivity. We typically say, I can't get it anywhere else. Uh, no one else does what you do. And I think, you know, they're kind of um, subcomponents to the exclusivity factor of the value proposition. But ultimately, it's, you know, it, to a certain extent, it can be, um, you know, how you do what you do and, and maybe your processes for doing it. If those are unique or different, um, this comes down to, um, you know, your organization, uh, your efforts, your programs, um, your approach, uh, how unique is it and how does it differ from uh, anyone else that might, uh, any other organizations that might be focused on the same, solving the same problems. Um, but really it comes down to, to this, you know, I, I can't get it anywhere else. 
and no one else does what you do. And I think uh, exclusivity really helps set your organization and your cause apart from other organizations. Uh, and uh, being able to clearly articulate that helps the donor understand why they should give to you. The next piece is credibility. And uh, ultimately it comes down to, do they believe you? Uh, it, do they believe that this is a, an attainable goal? Do they believe um, in, in your organization? Do they believe that uh, the outcomes that you're talking about can be achieved? Credibility is really, really important. Um, sometimes this kind of comes up in, in um, you know, seals of approval or security locks and other things like that on the donation pages because it shows uh, that you can be trusted. But really, when it comes to the, the value proposition itself, it comes down to really focusing on your organization, your approach, um, and your ability to create a uh, substantial or substantiated um, amount of proven impact, right? And so your ability to communicate your credibility really comes down to uh, the believability that the audience has, uh, that you can fulfill uh, the things that you're saying that you're gonna do with, uh, with their gift or their support today. And then the fourth and final piece of the value proposition is clarity. And clarity really comes down to, um, you know, can the donor understand it? Do they understand you? Do they understand the goal of the organization? Uh, do they understand how their gifts will be used? This clarity can be broken down into many subcomponents, but ultimately, um, you know, going through, I think this is one of the areas that's most important when we work with folks on uh, improving or testing their value proposition. Clarity really come, you know, is one of the things that is uh, readily available for us to, to drive improvements on. Um, too often, I think we as fundraisers, uh, as initiated folks, uh, have an opportunity or we communicate kind of uh, organizational speak, right? So we're initiated, we're in the organization, we're focused on, uh, we're so close to the mission and the work that we do that we just assume everyone sitting on the other side of the screen uh, understands that, uh, that lingo that we use, they understand kind of the acronyms that we use sometimes. Um, so clarity really helps um, take you know, suspend reality for kind of your experience in the world and your proximity to the mission and your proximity to the campaign and what it is that you're trying to achieve and really uh, is really kind of almost empathetic, uh, you know, driving empathy and thinking about the person on the other side of the screen to the point where, um, you know, you read it with uninitiated eyes and you focus on how can we make this more clear? How can we better articulate um, what it is that we're trying to achieve or um, how the donor might perceive this particular element of what it is that we're trying to say to them. So clarity is, is really, um, in my opinion, one of the low hanging fruit elements of uh, the value proposition and ways that you can improve it. And uh, if, you, if you don't believe me that this is really important, I think, you know, I've got a couple of experiments here, you know, just on main donation pages, I think, uh, just an increase in value proposition. Typically, you know, we run lots and lots of different studies. A lot of the different things that we talk about, we put into these web or that we that we study and experiment with, we put into these webinars. We talk to you guys about it. Maybe if you're a Next After Institute member, you've seen a lot of these experiments in um, in training sessions and in courses that we provide. But uh, you know, and sometimes we see 10, 20 percent lifts on some of these very tactical things. Um, the, what I like to tell folks is like, if you really dial in on your value proposition and improvements with your value proposition, that's how you get the triple digit, typically triple digit type increases in donor conversion or in revenue lift is focusing in on improvements to your value proposition. And again, it's one of those four kind of elements, your appeal, exclusivity, credibility, and clarity, and just being able to communicate to folks uh, and improve the clarity, uh, credibility, exclusivity, and appeal. Uh, that's going to drive that kind of massive big green arrow that you're looking for. Again, just some other examples here, 94% increase um, in uh, donations for this particular group. When we clearly articulated uh, a, a value proposition, um, and, and, and another, in, in case you need another example, a 250% increase uh, for this group, uh, when we focus the value proposition. And um, even 
reinforcing your value proposition in a lot of cases. Uh, you may think that this isn't necessary. We've actually found, you know, even if you have a good articulation of your value proposition, right at the last moment that they make their decision to give, which is right there on the submit button, that if you just reinforce your value proposition there, uh, that you can also have um, an impact, a positive impact, just by, again, you know, uh, if you think your value proposition is good, that's great. Uh, maybe here's a little tip to just reinforce it right at the point uh, that they're swiping a credit card per se on your donation page um, at that submit button. And really there's three whys of an appeal. I think this is really important to kind of consider. Um, you know, the, the third, um, you know, the widest area uh, on this kind of uh, graphic here is why care? Uh, I think you need to be able to articulate why somebody should care about this cause, why they should care about solving the problem. Um, and so, you know, clear, clear articulation of the problem and the solution I think are really important. I think then you can transition into the next piece of, uh, the second piece of the why in the appeal, which is why you, and this is where your exclusivity comes into play. So you're uniquely qualified, um, you have access that nobody else has, whatever it may be, I think these are the types of things um, that help uh, separate the organization uh, from the problem solution uh, and just deepen why your organization. And then of course, the why now um, in the context of your year end fundraising is really important as well. And, you know, I think um, too often organizations kind of focus on, uh, you know, hey, give because it's December 31st or today is Giving Tuesday. Really, those are not reasons to give. Um, or because we have a matching gift and the funds are running out. That's not a reason to give. Really, um, it, it's an incentive to give, but the offer should be kind of what we're looking at here. Why care? What's the problem? Uh, how, what's the solution that you're proposing? Uh, why should I give to you instead of uh, some other organization or not at all? And then, you know, again, the match, uh, the deadlines, those types of things, um, those are why you should give now uh, rather than why you should give at all. And uh, so, you know, I mean, again, when we, when we kind of properly frame this uh, and answer these three whys uh, as a part of our uh, value proposition, um, then, you know, we, we can uh, properly frame the incentives to give and those, uh, pro you know, appropriate articulations of the incentives to give uh, can help, you know, uh, drive better generosity so people may choose to give more uh, or they might choose to give now where they otherwise might not have chosen to give at all, right? Um, so that's, uh, that's kind of a primer or just a reminder maybe for some folks, um, about why the value proposition is so important and uh, how you can address that. The, uh, the next thing that I wanna talk about is uh, an element of your campaign that you may uh, be completely missing. And you know, I kinda let the cat out of the bag a little bit on the previous screen, but uh, that is a matching gift. Um, so we've done some experimentation around uh, no matching gift versus matching gift. And you know, just about every time uh, that we run these types of experiments, uh, we see things like this, right? So, um, you know, in this case, this organization uh, had a uh, an appeal with, with no matching gift that was articulated. Um, and in the case where there was a matching gift available during the campaign, we saw an 88% increase in donations for this particular organization. Again, here's another one, a, uh, a no match versus a match articulation. Again, we saw a 50% increase in donations with a match um, and then again, if there is a match, just uh, continual reinforcement through the process of checking out uh, on the campaign donation page uh, can potentially increase um, donations and, and subsequently revenue. So if you don't have a match, uh, it's really important that you, that you get one <laughs> because I think it, will, uh, it, may, it may be the one missing element um, in your campaign that can really have a material impact on your ability to produce results. And why do matching gifts work? Um, it works for a couple of reasons. Um, one, you know, build some camaraderie. I think if you've got a mid-level or a major gifts team um, that, uh, you know, you can kind of work uh, across the development organization in concert um, to really steward and prepare a major donor um, or a mid-level donor and possibly, um, 
get them to become uh, somebody that, that makes a matching gift available during these kind of year end seasons. Obviously, you know, this is uh, maybe a little late for some folks if you haven't started this process yet, but something to keep in mind for next year or your next big campaign, whether that be kind of your fiscal year end, these are opportunities for you to consider. Uh, but, you know, I mean, it, it gives you an opportunity to stretch your high capacity donors and inspire them really to create a movement. I think a lot of these high capacity donors are looking for opportunities to, um, you know, basically share your organization, your cause, uh, the impact that you can have. And they want to know that, um, that there, there are other people that, that share in the appreciation of your cause, your organization, your work. Um, and there's a sense of pride in that. And uh, by presenting a matching gift opportunity to those high capacity donors, uh, you can move them uh, in such a way to where uh, they can be inspired to help uh, provide matching gifts to help accelerate the value of uh, your organization's ability to to really raise money during this campaign season and have a, a, a year's worth of good impact um, in the next calendar year. Another reason why they work is, uh, you know, it inspires. Obviously, we've seen just a couple of examples uh, that I plucked out of our library to show uh, no match versus match articulation and the impact. I mean, it does inspire lower dollar donors to give when they otherwise might not. And uh, in a lot of cases, we see that they decide to give more generously, knowing that, um, you know, this, this limited time opportunity to kind of double their impact um, is, uh, is expiring. And so they might dig a little deeper uh, and decide to give a little bit more. We often see that as well. And then, you know, the last piece here is just that it provides opportunities for you to send more campaign messages as funds are running out. Um, you know, I've uh, done a lot of studies on these and run a lot of these kind of high urgency campaigns or catalytic fundraising campaigns, as I like to call them, um, like a calendar year end campaign. Um, you know, the what we typically find is that more e email uh, sent equals more revenue. And yes, there's a, you know, in some cases a proportional, um, you know, amount of unsubscribes, but, uh, the percentage of unsubscribes stay typically flat or kind of level out after the first couple of emails anyways. And so, um, you know, the people that are going to unsubscribe have already chosen to unsubscribe in a lot of cases and in a lot of the studies that I've looked at for these campaigns. So, you know, the, the consistent argument against sending more email in the context of a campaign is, uh, well, we don't want to fatigue people. We don't want to burn them out. Uh, we don't want to unsubscribe. And the reality is after the first couple of appeals in your campaign anyways, odds are the people that want out have already gotten out. And so sending additional emails is, uh, or, or not sending additional emails is really uh, just limiting your ability to raise additional funds. And so as these, um, matching gifts are available. And as uh, additional donors take advantage of that, uh, you can create opportunities uh, to write additional appeals and give them status updates on um, how those funds are being depleted. And so what that does beyond just the deadline is, uh, you know, approaching is also put a real, um, you know, a, a real emphasis on the fact that if you were planning to make a matching gift and have your gift matched and doubled, uh, the reality is that time is running out, but also the funds are running out because many have already taken advantage. That does a couple of things. One, the reader knows that they're in good company because lots of people are deciding to make a gift and take advantage of that. And uh, two, so everyone wants to be a part of a winning team. So uh, that reinforces that, um, that your organization, your cause is a winning team, that they are in the right spot and uh, in are in good company. Uh, but then two, it really kind of ratchets up that urgency towards uh, the end of the campaign and allows for uh, you to be able to send additional messages to uh, folks who have not yet taken advantage of the match so that they know, you know, realistically that uh, if, if they want to take advantage of that, that they shouldn't wait anymore and they should act now. And so what you'll see is that, um, you know, with each successive additional email where a match matches, uh, matching gifts funds are being depleted, um, it gives you additional opportunities to continue to ratchet the urgency outside of just the looming, you know, midnight, December 31st is on its way um, kind of, uh, you know, urgency that's that's built into every campaign. So, um, 
you know, a lot of folks might, might be sitting here and saying, okay, well, we don't necessarily have one or a handful of, uh, you know, highly capable donors um, that, could, that could make a substantial enough matching gift. Um, they're not just not capable. We don't, they're not stewarded. They're not, uh, you know, we don't have the relationship with them or whatever it might be. Um, you know, I've seen some organizations work with some organizations that have actually kind of seen this as an opportunity to actually use their digital program to, uh, build a match. And so, um, some of those campaigns look like this, basically, you know, if you look at your year end campaign, there are kind of two pivotal, um, kind of moments in that, um, year end campaign. Usually it's kind of giving Tuesday kick, kicks things off. Uh, New Year's Eve kind of closes things out. I mean, a lot of different organizations kind of, you know, vary wildly between those two kind of tentpole um, uh, moments inside of kind of the year end schedule. So, I mean, you might go all the way back to like well in advance of, of Thanksgiving. Um, something that you can consider is basically looking at, I mean, most organizations have some idea based on either giving history, donors who have given more uh, than others, um, in terms of online gifts or offline gifts, uh, you may have uh, capacity screen information where um, you have, uh, you maybe they haven't yet taken advantage of uh, an ask or given a gift of a large amount, but you know that they are screened at least of a, a donor with capacity. Um, you can kind of segment your, your file into kind of a higher capacity list based upon those two factors. And then if you don't know, you can kind of put everyone else in the lower capacity list and hold them out of this kind of match building portion of the campaign. And what you can do is kind of lead to a, uh, you know, the day before Giving Tuesday as a, um, or a few days before Giving Tuesday as, uh, as the match build phase for these higher capacity donors. So you can um, ask them to give a much larger gift than uh, maybe they otherwise would, but you set a goal and say, hey, look, we're trying to, um, create a matching gift for the rest of the file to, um, uh, to con you know, to, to stretch them and inspire them to give at your end, to come alongside you. Um, this is an opportunity for you to build a movement um, and, and lead the way. And lots of donors are inspired by that, um, by that kind of messaging. And so, especially higher capacity donors, they want to know uh, not only that they're on a winning team, but that, uh, you know, lots of people are behind them, uh, that they also agree that they're in good company, that this is a, a good cause. It's a worthy cause. It's worthy of uh, their support, but also, um, you know, it's, it's a growing cause that others are coming alongside them to support as well. So you can kind of like phrase um, a portion of your campaign leading up to Giving Tuesday as a match build phase. And then subsequently, you know, uh, your unknown or lower capacity donors, um, you can market to them during the typical time frame of Giving Tuesday through uh, calendar year end, um, you know, the whatever matching funds you were able to kind of populate or make available um, through that match build phase, uh, now you have a matching gift to go to the rest of the file and inspire additional giving and potentially better generosity uh, from those folks. So just some ideas there in terms of, um, you know, one, have a match, uh, and then two, uh, if you don't have a match or if your hands are tied on what you can do there, maybe looking at ways to build a match and being creative on uh, structuring your campaign, segmenting your list, uh, and being creative about uh, um, how you challenge or stretch the file of folks that have shown capacity or have been screened as higher capacity folks. So the next thing I want to talk about is uh, just three ways to make the most of your existing web traffic. And I think, you know, so often we think, well, it's all about email and what am I doing in email that we kind of lose sight of the fact that, uh, you know, our website is ever present. Uh, there are a lot of different people coming to our website for various reasons. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we should have an opportunity to be able to kind of uh, let them know <laughs> that they, this campaign is going on. Uh, it's a, it should be, obviously, if you've got your value proposition ironed out, um, you know, as we discussed earlier in the presentation, you should have a pretty clear articulation uh, for your case for support. And I think, you know, anyone who's landing on your website, uh, you should consider putting that case for support in front of them. So let's take a look at three different ways that you could do that. The first is to use your homepage and your navigation to make it easy for them to give. Um, so if uh, this is a theoretical, 
homepage, maybe it's your homepage, right? Um, some different ways that you can do that is call out and make sure uh, that your navigation is treated appropriately. Um, and then you can use some additional things like homepage ads, pop-outs, or pop-ups, slide outs, and even sticky bars um, to make sure that uh, they can't miss uh, the fact that you're trying to let them know about it. And I think, um, you know, too often organizations focus on what are we sending out and they don't focus on for the people who are coming in, how do we, how do we message to them? Um, so let's take a look at uh, navigation. Um, believe it or not, I mean, some folks, uh, you can see there, there's, uh, you know, the, the control and the treatment. Uh, this, this seems redundant, the treatment. You know, you can see there is a nice little uh, donate button kind of hidden somewhere in the middle of that um, navigation. We couldn't change it um, or, or break it out. So what we just proposed was putting a, a, a big button um, that's separate in, in, place of the, uh, in place of the search function that's on the website, just kind of change that header section a little bit above the navigation and made it really kind of pop out this make my gift. And what we found was, in this case, just adjusting the, the navigation, 74% increase in donations and 133% increase in average gift. Why is that? Just because more people knew it was there. It, it became easy. And I think that's kind of the key here is just when you're focused on um, not your outbound, what you're sending out to folks, but your inbound, people that are on your website, um, how to be able to how to monetize them and, and be able to introduce the can, campaign case for for support to them. Uh, the key is to make it easy for people. I think too often uh, we get stuck again, kind of like I was saying earlier around um, clarity is in the value proposition is that we're too close to it, and so really suspend um, the way that you look at your website and go, okay, can somebody quickly and easily within five seconds or less figure out how to give. And if the answer is no, come up with different ways to treat that um, and, and be opportunistic with it because really it's about simplicity. Um, mitigating friction. There's two types of uh, mitigating factors, friction and anxiety. Anxiety is psychological resistance to take action. Friction is the difficulty to take action. Friction is the easier part to address. And that's really just focusing on making it easy for them. So put, putting a big fat button on your navigation, coloring it different and saying, make my gift. Um, can have a profound impact on your, your year-end uh, fundraising campaign this year. Um, so number two, uh, we should just get more from our existing articles in our blog. So if uh, your, your organization has daily news or weekly news um, that's posted on the website or different blog articles, stories of impact, things like that, um, that are promoting people coming into the site um, for, you know, uh, for readership, you're going to have more and more folks um, on the website. So how do you get the most out of um, those particular um, articles? We've, we've actually tested locations and placements. Uh, we've tested uh, a lot of different approaches, but uh, here's just one client that, um, you know, we call these dear readers. And basically it's an end of an article um, on your website. And uh, you see right in here, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but like right before it says, you may also like, and uh, there's a tags section. This is kind of standard um, information that shows up on, on the site template when the article is over. It has these tags. It has related articles. Uh, and on the right-hand sidebar there, you've got um, different ads. And so, you know, what, we've, what we actually do is we stick in a dear reader. So we intercept uh, at the end of the article. Um, the reader and, and we make it look in like inline content like it's a part of the article and what you do is you end up getting a lot more readership there uh, we've tested placement um, higher up in the article in the middle of the article and at the end and we found uh, without a doubt that at the end of the article before any of that kind of tagging or related articles uh, portion of your site uh, and these different article pages right in there if you stick this kind of note to our readers or dear reader, we want you to know um, this is important. You know, you can you can start to promote um, your case for support. You can start to really let them know what it is that you're fundraising for at year end or that the campaign exists. We've also uh, seen during year end campaigns that uh, putting a countdown clock in there, um, a dynamic countdown clock that's just ever ticking uh, will also boost results. But in this case, 
uh, by adding a call to action right at the end of the article in that dear reader section, as we like to call it, uh, we saw a 568% increase in donations. So really, you know, the, again, it's just that inline message. Dear reader, we want to tell you about this thing that we have going on. Uh, give it a shot and see what you can do. I, I would highly, highly recommend that you consider adding a dear reader ask to your content pages, um, especially in the last or final month of the year. Um, but also consider it all year. Um, number three here is turn your homepage into your donation page. So this one's a little bit more radical. Often, you know, the homepage has, uh, we have some difficulty, uh, you know, there are many stakeholders, there's a lot of different audience types, different constituencies that we have to serve internally, externally. Um, there's not one true owner of the homepage. Um, and so, you know, in, in development, you're probably, you're in the fundraising group, you're probably uh, pushing a boulder uphill trying to get this approved. But I think it's worth it. It's worth having a conversation about it. And so I wanted to present it to you all today. In this case, uh, this organization, um, you know, we had their homepage and what we did, uh, you know, this is what the control experience looked like. This is how they were going to, uh, you know, announce their matching gift. It looked like a banner ad. What we did was we created kind of this thermometer. We took over the homepage and really this homepage became a donation page where they could transact. Whereas the control experience looked like a banner ad that you had to, and it, and it acted like a banner ad. You had to click it and then it went to the donation page. Um, and in, in this case, what we saw was that this, you know, uh, uh, you know, we took over kind of the upper portion of it and then the rest of it, you know, again, the, the donation page or the donation form was embedded directly on the homepage. In this case, uh, we saw a 24% increase in donations when the homepage was actually a donation, donation page. Um, another way to kind of like treat this is take your standard campaign donation page. If you think it's applicable to all audiences and safe for all audiences to take a look at, another way to do it is kind of like how Heritage uh, did it in 2019. So you put a little kind of header bar on the top that says continue to heritage.org. Please click here. Um, so clicking there, it's the first thing they see on the page. Um, that'll immediately send them to the homepage. Uh, and then the other thing that we do here is just kind of change the headline. Um, we say welcome to the homepage, um, the homepage domain. And, um, you know, just a little blurb here that says, please take a moment to read this special message before you continue, continue to the homepage. Um, and then the rest of it is just kind of standard appeal copy that's on your year-end form. Uh, for this organization, we actually found that about 10% of their overall revenue that was raised from mid-November through New Year's Day uh, was raised in the final three days of the year by taking over the homepage. So you can have a pretty profound impact. Um, and by the way, 10% may not sound like much. Uh, it's a pretty significant amount of, uh, of revenue for this particular organization. They raise a lot of money at the at, at the end of the year. So, um, and they do a lot of it online. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's a it could have a profound impact for you, um, and something worth considering. But uh, you know, usually takes a lot of work in terms of like meeting with the various key stakeholders internally, um, and going through rigorous reviews and approvals on the copy, the approach, um, things of the like. So, you know, I think if you've got a testing platform that could do A/B split on the traffic. Um, you know, you could mitigate risk by only presenting it to 50% of the audience, a, a system or a tool like Google Optimize could help you do that. Um, so, you know, there's different ways that you could uh, theoretically uh, mitigate risk um, beyond just the number of days that you want to make this kind of homepage takeover available, right? So let's uh, move on to our final piece here. It's just four ideas to jolt your campaign with paid ads. I think... Um, you know, we'll kind of move quickly through this and, um, you know, uh, we'll, we'll have a wrap and we'll rec recap what we looked at today and uh, we'll close out the presentation. But uh, four ID before we do that, four ideas to jolt uh, your campaign with paid ads. So the first is to consider targeting your direct mail audience with Facebook ads. So uh, Facebook allows you to take an audience uh, and upload it into its audience management uh, tool. And then you can, uh, it'll go through and it basically try to uh, match as many of those people uh, as Facebook users as it can. And its ability to do that or the, per the percentage of that list that you upload 
um, that it can find and match with a hundred percent level of confidence is really based upon the amount of information that you upload to Facebook. So, uh, what can you upload? Um, you can, you know, the highest match rates, uh, typically require a, a unique mobile identification number. Odds are you don't have that sitting around in your, in your CRM, uh, and you've never asked for it. And even if you did, <laughs> your donors probably don't even know what that is. So, um, you know, a mobile identification uh, number match is typically a 90% plus uh, match on your uploaded list. But since you probably don't have that, um, since since you don't have that, let's just say that, uh, <laughs> the next best thing that you could do is provide an email address. An email address is a unique identifier, but because these are direct mail folks, odds are you probably don't have an email address for them. Um, if you did, you'd probably see somewhere around 60% percent uh, match rate for um, uh, 60 to 80 percent typically on on the list that you upload uh, but again because these are direct mail folks you probably don't have a, a, a uh, an email address for them um, so uh, the next best thing is to make sure that you have first name last name um, city state zip uh, and if you've got any additional information like date of birth or anything like that um, that's going to just boost your results. But typically just a, a direct mail only list with no email address, no mobile identification number. Um, you're, you're probably going to see somewhere, it depends on the size of the list, but uh, typically somewhere between 20 to 40% of the size that you upload is going to be matched into uh, uh, definitive Facebook users. And then uh, once, once you have that list uploaded and ready to be marketed to, you can start to put your year-end messages in ads and just target that list uh, with a call to action uh, to click into and, and take a look at your, your uh, to make their year-end gift. And uh, I didn't put the slide in here, but typically when you do that, uh, you can also get them to become a first-time online donor in a lot of cases, uh, which then trips them into a multi-channel -don multi donor cohort, uh, which most of the studies that we run show typically a two to three X value when you get somebody, an offline only donor, to become a multi-channel donor. Uh, with that being said, I digress. Key is uh, just send your, uh, you know, get your list into Facebook uh, and then target that list with year-end urgency ads um, and, and, and start to see if you can reach people in an additional channel. I think the key here is, you know, there's a lot going on in uh, these in our donors lives during this time of year, there's holiday shopping, there's big box retailers that are marketing to them, um, you know, for, for holiday gift ideas and things of the like, they're trying to manage probably uh, busy schedules, maybe not so much now during the pandemic, but um, nevertheless, this is usually a, a, a very busy time. And so really it often comes down to just what I call mind share. And so uh, the more that you can surround yourself and reach your prospective audience, your prospective or existing donors in as many channels as possible, be there to be ever present, ever reminding them that you're there. Um, odds are you're going to win, right? Uh, you're going to achieve the result that you're looking for, which is the highest amount of, uh, of people in the available audience uh, responding and making a year end gift. So um, if you've sent direct mail letters, Odds are you, you may have some that have email addresses that you've also emailed. In this case and in this study, we also bolted in uh, Facebook ads. We saw a 20% increase in donations uh, when we added the Facebook audience. The, the key here though is the incremental expense that we put into the campaign in the treatment segment to run these ads, we actually saw a 2x increase in the return on investment just on the incremental expense alone. So let me let me just put that picture in the frame for you. So in this study, what we did was we uploaded our direct mail targets and then we started running ads to them. Yes, there was additional expense to run those ads, but the 20% increase in donor conversion, we also saw about a 13% increase in average gift from the people that also saw the ads. And so when that all kind of uh, cumulatively multiplied against itself, what we ended up with was an incremental amount of additional revenue in the treatment segment. And when we look at the incremental revenue and, and uh, divide the, that, re that cost by the revenue, we had a two times increase on the additional expense. So 
you know, obviously be very opportunistic with it. Uh, don't allocate a tremendous amount of budget. If you've never done this before, test your way into it. Be very meticulous and calculated uh, with how you go about doing this. But um, know that at least in this case and in this particular study, uh, we saw a 2x increase on incremental revenue against the incremental expense to run ads to our direct mail audience. So uh, that's, uh, that's one idea. The next idea here is to put your donation page copy into your Facebook ads. So uh, this might actually kind of double up with the previous um, strategy, but in, the, in, this, in this study, uh, we had an ad that was focused on, you know, trying to bait the hook for a click, learn more, click the plan. You know, will you do your part? You know, these kinds of like open-ended questions to get our audience to basically uh, click into the ad to consider uh, making a gift once they've looked at the campaign donation page. And then uh, my dear friend, Tim Kachuriak had this harebrained idea and said, hey, why don't you just take your whole donation page copy and put it into the ad text and run that and see what happens. And it uh, turns out uh, it was at a 94% level of confidence. So just one percentage point shy of where we typically want to see a validated level of confidence. But nevertheless, this is about, this is right on the doorstep of about 19 out of 20 times that we're going to run this experiment. We're going to see the same results at 94% level of confidence. We saw a 70% increase in donations from running our whole donation page copy, the whole long form appeal, just putting it into the ad copy and letting folks in our target audience, our prospecting list, as well as our uploaded target list, uh, take a look at the whole donation page copy. And, and, and why is that? Um, and the, the whole idea is like most of the time, and you're gonna get a lot more ad impressions than you are going to get ad clicks. Um, typically, you know, really well performing campaigns, you're gonna see somewhere between five to 10% of, uh, you know, the people that see your ad are gonna click on it. Um, most of these kind of direct appeal campaigns are gonna be much, much lower because you're setting the motivation. Um, as a, once you click, you're going, you're expected to give. And so people are making the decision at the ad level, should, do I want to click this? Because I know they're going to ask on the other side of it. And this, this control ad, you know, is nifty and, you know, fancy footwork as we were trying to do to try to get somebody to just click the ad. Uh, the reality is people, people know kind of what's going on. They know what's going to be expected of them once they click the ad. Um, so why not use the donation page copy, which is the best pitch that you have for why they should give and put that at the ad level so that when they're considering whether or not they should click it, they've got all of the information there right at the ad level um, so that they can read through that in, uh, in their decision at the point of the ad of, do I want to give once I click? is already got the best pitch on why they should give embedded right there. And that's why, you know, we believe in this particular study, 69% uh, increase in donations when writing the long form appeal and putting it right in the ad text. And, um, you know, a lot of folks always ask, well, what about uh, once they click and they see the same exact copy, is that, is that a, a mitigating factor? No. Obviously, we have the 70% increase in, in donations, but on top of that, what, what usually happens is somebody reads the ad, they're motivated to give, they click, they get to the landing page or the donation page, and they go, oh, I already read this, and they skim right down to the donation form, they make their gift, and off they go. Um, so this is another technique that could potentially help you uh, break through the clutter and make sure that you get the best ask in front of as many people as you possibly can, which is your year-end donation page. Uh, the third thing here is just uh, looking at your search ads. So a couple quick hits here. Um, you know, up here at the top, uh, being able to kind of like upload your list into Google is a possibility. So you can target your search ads and uh, display ads and things of the like. Uh, but you can also like basically say anyone who's searching for my brand keywords, which might be key staff members, it might be, you know, the organization's name, things of the like, uh, you can run a specific ad to people uh, to just redirect them from uh, the search engine directly into your donation page. Uh, we've seen this be pretty effective. And, um, you know, subsequently, the, the area down below is, uh, is the fourth point here that I wanted to talk about, which is your site leak extensions as well. So on your search ads, 
If you haven't activated these, this is another area of inventory. So if you don't want to, or if you can't control um, the year end ad itself running on your brand keywords, um, at least fighting for an opportunity in your site link extensions, which are down below to be able to say, uh, you know, make your year end donation or, um, you know, make a year end play here. And, and these little site link extensions, at least on Google will, uh, give you more inventory, create, um, a better ge just geographical, take up more space on that search engine results page. And it gets more eyeballs on the year end, uh, calendar year end kind of donation page. Uh, that they can consider clicking into. So with all that being said, let's just summarize. Um, we started out with a goal. Uh, let's see if we accomplished it. So uh, summary of today's learnings. The first is just, just remember to fir focus first and foremost on your value proposition because again, this is the foundation for the ask. It's, it's the whole reason why uh, you exist and, and why somebody should give to you instead of some other organization or not at all. And if, if you don't get that right, if that's not clearly articulated, if it's not compelling, if it's, um, you know, it, it doesn't sound very appealing. Uh, if everyone, if they can, if they can make a gift to a thousand different organizations and accomplish the same goal, they're not going to give to you. So you really need to focus on your value proposition in uh, making sure that um, you get that right, but then also that you reinforce it throughout your campaign. Uh, I showed you a couple of examples today on how value proposition reinforcement can also uh, continue to drive results um, on the donation pages and sticky bars and other things like that. So even if you've got your value proposition dialed in, find ways to reinforce it throughout the giving process as well. The next thing here is just, uh, if you don't have a matching gift for your campaign, figure out how to get one. Um, and that might be working closely with mid or major gift officers to help identify donor, a handful of donors that are capable and then putting a case for support and working with them ahead of time uh, to be able to do that. And if that's not the case, then basically splitting your file based upon uh, giving histories or gift capacity screening, depending upon what information you have available to you and uh, presenting a, a match building phase of the campaign so that uh, many donors can consider giving stretch gifts to feed into one fund that'll help the rest of the file really come alongside them and together you'll accomplish the best results. The last thing here or second to last thing here is just use the power of your existing website. I think too often we only focus on what is it that we're sending out. We don't focus on who's coming in and how do we get the most out of those folks. Um, so we walked through some examples today about how you can change your navigation, homepage takeovers, turning your homepage into um, your donation page for the last couple of days of the year um, in ways that other organizations have used these techniques and, and tactics to drive increased results by just making it simple for people to be able to know that a campaign is happening and that, uh, they, can, that they can contribute to it and make a gift to it. And then the last piece here is just be creative in how you use and target your paid ads to boost your results. We walked through a few examples about, um, you know, simple low hanging fruit things that you can do in terms of uploading people that you can't reach online right now or direct mail folks and running ads to them. Um, and then regardless of whether it's just them or people that you've got email addresses for taking your, um, your best uh, case for support, which is your donation page copy and putting it in the ad level itself, and allowing uh, you know, more people to see um, the best pitch that you've got, but then also just bolting on an additional channel and making sure that you put a little incremental budget in to cut through the clutter and make sure that they know that you're there and that you're a worthy cause and remind them uh, that uh, their support is, is desperately needed, but also they can have a, a pretty incredible impact on changing lives next year and who doesn't wanna do that. So with all that being said, I just want to say thanks for your time today. Sorry for a little bit of the, uh, the fits and starts uh, related to the office closures, but I appreciate you guys being with us today, and I look forward to live Q&A. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Greg, thank you so, so much. Uh, I love that you can just like dive like way deeper into the weeds of some of this stuff, especially on the advertising side of things, because you're, you're in it every day. So uh, I'm grateful for your perspective. I'm sure our listeners are grateful for your perspective. And uh, we've, got, we've got a good amount of questions and I'm sure some more will come in here soon. Are you ready for them? Yeah, sure, why not? I mean, I, 
am I allowed to, do I just have to like do one pose at a time <laughs> per question? Yes, if you could keep the like blue steel face the whole time that you're talking, my, that would be ideal. My favorite was this one. I was like pinching something, I think. <laughs> yeah, there's some good ones. Some eyes closed, some, ah, oh, for a while. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, Nathan, okay. and I, Nathan and I were sending emojis to each other that uh, <laughs> most closely resembled my frozen face. I'm going to create a Greg emoji collection and send that to you later. <laughs> um, let's, ju let's jump in. We've got a bunch. I've also got some additional resources I'll pull up that we can share here in a few minutes. Um, a question from Maya talking about matching and matching gifts. Uh, she's wondering, is it too late at this point to try a matching campaign? If not, like, how would you recommend someone start figuring out, like, how do I even go find donors to put up a matching challenge? Yeah, I, th I think, um, I mean, it, it kind of depends on how big your file is, how many more messages you plan to send as a part of your year-end campaign. Um, and, and also, um, you know, the, the complexity or difficulties that it takes um, to get an ask like that out in front of a high capacity donor. Um, you know, but so I, I guess the classic consultant answer is it depends. <laughs> I mean, it, should you should you do it? Uh, yeah, I think it's worth it. You know, I think um, I think you should take a shot, and um, you know, I think there's there's great opportunity in it. You saw a couple of examples. I think even introducing a match late uh, in the process um, can inspire new. Um, I mean, people who maybe have gotten a couple emails early and said, "Ah, they're not necessarily my top charity." Um, maybe, you know, and then you come back to them a little later in the campaign and say, Hey, look, your impact's going to be doubled. That might change their opinion. Um, the other thing is too, uh, I have seen some success where, um, the matching gift was, uh, too much. Um, you know, so, a, a, a very generous donor made a, a really large matching gift available, uh, late in the game for, for one customer. And, uh, we were only able to match about 50% of it. And we took a month off in January and we came back around in February and said, hey, look, uh, this matching gift is expiring if it's not used by the end of this month. So would you help us match that? And we were able to clear the rest of it. So, I, you know, e even if you can't um, necessarily get it all in uh, for year end, I think there's some creative ways that uh, you can go back to the file and, uh, and continue to use it um, quickly in the new year, too. Well, that kind of touches on uh, the second question here that I had from Lauren, who said that they had a matching goal uh, on Giving Tuesday. So yesterday, it sounded like they didn't quite meet the goal. And she's wondering, you know, what's the best way to position that if they go back to their donors and say, hey, we didn't make it, but we still got this match. Does that hurt their credibility or is there a good way to message that throughout the rest of the season? Yeah, no, I mean, I think... Um... I think transparency, clarity always, um, you know, trumps persuasion. And so, um, you know, I think that I say that on one hand, but on the other hand, you know, I think you have to be positive. Um, I think it's our responsibility to be uh, as positive as we can, uh, but as forthright and, and honest and open with our donors as possible. And so, you know, I think if we didn't make it, I think, um, we don't necessarily need to dwell on the fact that we didn't make it. I think we go, we roll with what we've got and we position it in, in a, in as positive a light as we possibly can. Cool. Cool. Thank you. Hopefully that's helpful for both Maya and Lauren here. Um, Meg was asking this and then there was a, it looked like there was a bit of a thread talking about different people who have tested some of this messaging, which is cool to see people testing. Please do more of that. That's amazing. But the question was uh, just simply, how do you position the donation ask in your language? Is it better to say, oh, where'd it go? I just lost it. There's the, there's the thread. Uh, she was saying, is it better to say donate or give or make a gift or something else? Like, have we tested that? Have you seen any differences there? Uh, yeah, I, you know, there may be experiments in the library, I think, with that. Um, have I personally tested much with it? No. Um, you know, I, I, I like to... Um, as a part of these campaigns, I like to, you know, uh, do what's called a micro ask. And so uh, I look at, uh, this is a little bit kind of 201 or 301, but um, looking at what a donor's highest gift has been um, in making, a, you know, pushing data back into the database and then using merge tags to basically say, 
you know, hey, I'm looking for two donors who can make a thousand dollar gift today. Do you think you could be one of them, right? And I think that's a little lower and you, you get the problem solution articulation, you get a little bit of the, the you know, exclusivity factor in the organization mm -hmm. play. But when it comes time to ask, you just ask, right? Um, and so um, w whether you're saying make a gift, I've, I've seen, you know, and, and kind of done, um, just made some tweaks to, to certain things where, it's uh, framed as would you make your most special gift or would you make another gift or uh, would you donate today? Um, you know, I think at the end of the day, I think most donors kind of get the gist. They all kind of mean the same thing to them. I think really just making sure that you ask is the most important thing. You can, it's certainly a testable concept. And here's what I'll say just kind of in general to, to tie off that thought is, you know, what works over here doesn't necessarily always work over here. Everyone's audience is a little bit different. They've been cultivated a little differently. Um, you know, the flow of the communication is, is a little unique um, and the personality of the sender or the organization is always a little different. And so, you know, I think um, it is a testable concept. I think there's probably, um, you know, better insights to learn and, and more opportunity to learn uh, and see bigger lifts. Um, I guess would be something like that is probably not going to validate, but, um, you know, it's, it is testable if you want to test it. Cool. And it sounds like uh, our friends at National Fragile X Foundation have tested it a little bit. Uh, they were saying just in the chat thread, oh, they, they tested you can help versus donate and donate seemed to perform better in terms of conversion, but you can help got more clicks. So that's always like making sure you test the right thing or measure the right metric. Yeah, that we've seen that. Like I, I mentioned in the presentation, um, like Dear Reader ads and, and also like even like the Facebook donation page copy being in the ad text too. I think these both have similar concepts where we've tested like learn more versus donate. And, um, you know, it's, it's kind of a, um, you know, essentially comes down to like, you'll get a lot more clicks, but you'll have a higher bounce rate, um, the less uh, direct you are. And, yeah. and the reason for that is it comes down to clarity, right? So if you click this, my expectation is that you'll give, right? So if you click it, you're going to give, right? And usually when you when you kind of message in that way, uh, you'll have a much higher conversion rate post-click. So you'll see 50, 60% of the people that click will end up giving maybe even higher. I've seen up to like 80% in some cases. Um, but you know the, the volume of people that click is like this relative mm -hmm. to that. And so it's kind of like, you know, you do have to play with that language a little bit because, uh, you know, sometimes maybe um, it's better to get more eyeballs on the page um, than it is to get um, fewer number of people with a higher percentage of those people deciding to give yeah. uh, in, in the level above the donation page. That's good. It's insightful. Um, a question from a, a group called the Pursuit of History, and they're wondering, is it helpful to also, this is around Facebook ads now, is it helpful to also target your existing email list with Facebook ads? And, and if so, which I'm assuming the answer is you would say yes, is there a unique approach there compared to like just retargeting direct mail? Would those ads look different? So any thoughts there? Uh, no, and I'll do, I'll do you one better. I mean, it, at the very least, start, start somewhere and start you know, where, where you should start based on this presentation is take your donation page copy and put it in, 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 in your Facebook ad text, right? Um, and yes, you should target your existing non-donors or house file email list. And I'll do you one better. You should also, um, you should also take your unsubscribers from the year if you've taken them out of your email system and put them into Facebook because I've also, um, I've also kind of experimented with that and found that uh, they're 300% more likely to give a gift to you again when presenting content offers and other things like that. I haven't necessarily tested it for year end, but mm. they're, they're, uh, the cost to reacquire them as a donor is like 80% less than, than getting somebody fresh off of the street to give their first gift through Facebook ads. So I would even say, make sure that you take your unsubscribe lists, people who have said, I'm no longer interested in receiving email from you, You've exported those, you've gotten them out of the system, go find those lists, put those in Facebook, put it in an ad group called unsubscribes and start marketing to it. I promise you, you'll love the cost per result. <laughs> That's awesome. It's a nice little, little pro tip there. Uh, Bob is wondering about LinkedIn. Uh, and I don't recall if we've ever really done much with LinkedIn, specifically with donations, but do you have any experience there? 
Yeah, we yeah we played around with it a little bit, and and so what we did was we took um, like existing offers that were running in like Facebook, and then we just lifted those ads and dropped them in LinkedIn. Um, and and here's I mean LinkedIn is it's got a little a lot of bells and whistles to it. Um, you know, it, it also has a, kind of a bad reputation for like direct marketing, um, and and so. You know, I, I definitely wanted to try it. And, and what we found was that we couldn't just lift our current messaging in Facebook mm-hmm. and just drop it into LinkedIn. It, it just was not effective. Um, and we also noticed like a three to five times uh, inflation on cost per clicks from what we were seeing in Facebook. So it was a lot more expensive to get somebody to click just using the same creative. Now, having said that, I think there's different ways to use it. And if you think about LinkedIn, it's a more professional network. I think, um, you know, in some cases it might make sense to do um, very specific types of campaigns that are targeted to more of like a professional audience, like a working audience, Um, or even like if your organization is working on certain causes that affect people specifically like in a particular industry, uh, a business industry type segment, um, you know, there could be things there that you could do in terms of talking about the benefits of to your corporation, if it's like a C-suite type person um, or something of that regard. Um, I think you, there's just a different way that I think we have to use it that uh, to be honest with you, I think there's just so much untapped potential in the existing channels. It's just always been put on the back burner for us. Yeah, that makes total sense. And even on, on my side of things is doing more of the um, marketing for for us trying to reach you know fundraisers. I mean, just you can get a lot more targeted for sure in finding people that are like specifically interested in fundraising, but the costs just go through the roof. And so it's hard to justify sometimes. So yep. yeah, I think you're right on with, you know, it's gotta be a unique approach, not a one size fits all ad campaign. Um, let's see here. We've got a question from Megan about how big or small the Facebook audience can be. It sounds like they have a total donor list of about 1200 donors. And so she's wondering, can we take that and even like break that apart into different levels of donor groups? So what, like, what's the threshold for, I have to have X amount of you know, names going into Facebook for it to even be worthwhile. Yeah, sure. I think, uh, I think if you're going to run lookalike models, I think there's a minimum threshold. Um, there, there might be some minimums. I think if you're under hundred or something, you may run into some issues, but like I said, I think, I think it's, I think it's, you know, you're safe over that hundred mark um but again i think if you're go- it really c- the size of your audience loaded um really comes down to less about um you know direct marketing to that list and it's more about if you're going to build a lookalike model to that list which by the way you should do if you're going to upload your donors um you know and you're, you're going to need a hundred um, a minimum donors uh to build a a you know um a reasonable lookalike audience. So if you try to upload less than a hundred and build a lookalike, Facebook will will kick it back to you. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think with twelve hundred, you should be you should be great. Cool. We've got a few more questions before we jump to those. I do want to share, you know, a few additional resources as people are you know starting to head back to getting their campaign set up and all that stuff and residual things from Giving Tuesday. So before um, you know you sign off, I do want to share just a few a few quick things. Number one. Uh, starting tomorrow, uh, we have sort of this um, you know, video series you can subscribe to called the 12 Days of Year End Fundraising. Uh, so you can actually check that out at nextsefforcom slash 12 days. So for the next 12 business days, we're going to send you a little video tip in your inbox, uh, things that you can you know, hopefully do day of to grow your uh, year end fundraising campaign, different quick ideas that you can implement from subject line ideas uh, to looking in Google Analytics for new ideas as to what worked in the past that you could keep redoing. Uh, so feel free to check that out next after to com slash 12 days. And then you can find a bunch of different uh, year end resources to help you throughout the rest of the season at next after dot com slash year end from training to research uh, to different blog posts and different experiments, podcasts, things like that. So feel free to check all that out again at next after dot com slash year end. You can find everything there. Just Nathan, a couple. You had a, you had a nice little pose there in your screenshot. I know. I, someone <laughs> told me I look like a model in that pose, and yeah, I have no, to agree. You got, the, you got the blue steel look going. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing my best. Doing my best. Um, okay, Cheryl is wondering about, like, what's the approximate cost of Facebook ads? And I know that's a big question, uh, but maybe in the context of, 
you know, you're retargeting direct mail people, what can you expect to spend? Yeah, I think it, again, it depends. It depends on how long you want to run it. It depends on how you want to buy it. It depends on how big your audience is. Um, you know, that that's going to impact everything. I think it also comes down to, we've done some experimentation and put some stuff in the library um, in the last six months or so around um, how you buy it. And so hmm. uh, we're starting to, to see also that that plays a role in um, your overall cost per outcomes associated with it. But I mean, again, just kind of like, it, it's, it's hard to say, but I mean, it depends on how compelling your stuff is. It depends on uh, how, you know, uh, how much somebody is uh, understands or, or is affiliated with your organization, those types of things. Uh, it's, it's probably safe to assume that um, most of these digital ads will, will kind of um, come down to a cost per click metric. And I think it's probably um, safe to assume that you're probably looking somewhere between, you know, again, I, it, it depends on the cause as well. <laughs> Sorry for so many depends, but um, you know, if you're running ads on social and political issues, there, there's always a little bit more competition. There's inflation with the, the CPCs of the cost per clicks there. But I think it's it's probably safe to assume that if you have a finite audience, they're you know a direct mail person. They they understand and, and kind of know who you are. Um, the the list is relatively sizable. Um, you've got a, a decent amount of budget in there. You've got a long runway that you're giving Facebook uh, a chance to run those ads. And it's not just like a 48 hour window type of thing that, uh, you know, maybe a dollar 50 or less per click somewhere between 75 cents and a dollar 50 per click makes sense. I think with the direct mail audience, the one thing that, that you have to really kind of consider when you're setting up those campaigns is they give offline and uh, that's their offline donors to you. And, uh, you know, part of the reason why they haven't switched into being an online donor for you is because they're not online very much, right? And so <laughs> you can only really reach them in Facebook when they're online. And so you got to give it, you know, a couple weeks to run and, and, and give it an opportunity to try to find those folks. Um, because when they're on, Facebook is going to, you know, jump on them and, and try to really get after them. Um, so you'll see kind of like some fits and starts and, and bumps. Typically, you know, weekends, uh, nights and weekends is when you'll see, but especially weekends is when you'll see, um, you know, additional spending. Um, so you, you want to make sure that you run it at least through one, if not two weekends, uh, preferably just to give yourself an opportunity to reach those folks. Cool. Thanks, Ricky. That's helpful. Hopefully that's helpful for Cheryl too, to, just, to give a little more context, especially if it's, you know, the first time jumping in doing Facebook ads. It's hard to know, like what, like how, how much money do I set this for? What do I spend per click? All that stuff. So it's helpful. Yeah, I mean, for the for the study that we did uh, that I showed, I think it was, I think, I mean, it was certainly less than two thousand um, on that. And so, you know, is what the incremental spend was. The runtime um, for that campaign, I think, it was like fifteen days or something like that. So, you know, I think it's 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 pretty safe to assume that if you give it two weeks or so. You know, you want to dial it down to, you know, 500 or a thousand. I think, you know, something is better than nothing. And Facebook is going to prioritize uh, based on uh, what you, what you're telling its success looks like, which is, you know, a purchase or a donation um, against this finite audience. You have this much bu budget to spend in this number of days. It's going to wait because it knows, okay, these people are more likely based on their online uh, search behavior, what kind of websites they go to, the fact that they went to their website multiple times haven't given in, in a decent amount, like I'm going to wait until this person's online. I know they come out on Saturdays, you know, that, that believe it or not, the Facebook algorithm kind of knows all that. It knows all that and it knows everything else. It's all, it it's always listening. It knows, it knows we're talking right now about it. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. Uh, we're going to, we're going to, we have time for like, we'll say two more questions here and then we'll have to end. So if we don't get to your question, feel free to shoot me an email directly at Nathan at nextafter.com. We can try to get um, you some additional answers. And then again, feel free to go to nextafter.com slash year end. Lots of additional resources for you there as well. Um, a question from National Fragile X. Uh, they're wondering, should our retargeting Facebook ads be directly to a donation ask? Because a lot of the, you know, in our Facebook course, we talk a lot about don't go straight to a donation ask. You know, you should have some type of free offer that leads to an instant donation appeal. So is this different and how and why is it different? 
Yeah, I think um, so. Remarketing is a little bit different because they've theoretically they've already seen. I mean, if you're doing it right, you should be targeting people who've seen a, a donation page, whether it's a campaign or instant donation page or your main donation page. And you can get into the like specific page targeting if you have your pixel installed properly across your website and, and be able to say, okay, I want to see people who've seen this page but have not purchased in this amount of time. And they go into this you know, bucket and that's your remarketing list. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it's okay to, to be able to kind of follow up. Um, we've done some testing too with remarketing audiences. I put a couple of studies this year into um, you know, what's the right way to do remarketing. We've done some like video views and remarketing for purchases uh, for video viewers. That wasn't very good. <laughs> we did, um, you know, like people who saw a donation page and maybe, um, you know, promote a, a different content offer. That wasn't as good. So, you know, I think um, as good as basically like remarketing a, a straight donation play after they've seen a donation page, but have not yet converted. Um, so remarketing, I think is, is a little bit different. Um, and you have to assume that, um, you know, you can, you can go for a, a bigger value proposition. Whereas, you know, in a lot of these cases and in, in our courses, a lot of that is focused on acquisition of net new um, first time donors. And so um, when you're doing those things, absolutely, you know, uh, but I will tell you, I mean, I've, I've been pretty, uh, you know, I've, I've, I was 100% on board with the next after line of thinking of like content offer to instant donation page. I will say I've been doing a lot of uh, experimentation, even with like uh, direct acquisition of recurring donors with a mm. long form appeal uh, for recurring gifts. Um, and targeting prospect lists with that and going straight from the ad to the recurring uh, donation ask and being very, very successful at that in the last several months with prospects too. So yeah, don't be afraid to, to test, especially during year end. Um, that's your pitch, you know? So like I was saying, take your, take your best pitch and put it in front of as many people as you possibly can and let them make the decision. I love it. I love it. Um, okay. Cool. If you have some, I know there's a few questions we didn't get to in here. I apologize for that. If you if you want to chat about some of these again, shoot me an email, Nathan at nextafter.com. Let me pass some of those to Greg. I know he's busy with uh, lots of your end campaigns too, so I don't want to fill up his inbox. Um, Greg, last question I have for you is, you know, if someone's going to do one thing from this, there's a lot that we've talked about. You know, where, where's the best place to to start to get kind of the biggest bang for your buck, if you will? Um. I would say that's a tough, <laughs> tough question. You, you threw me, threw me a tough one to close it. Uh, I mean, I would, I would probably say um, homepage takeover, uh, homepage donation page rather. Um, you know, I just, it, I, it, it was last year was the first time that we really kind of pushed on people to, to do something that dramatic. A lot of the organizations that tried that uh, were, were very pleasantly surprised by the results that they uh, achieved from it. And, um, you know, I mean, if you think about it, it's just kind of like moving your, your um, it's just like the moving your donation page copy to the ad level. It's moving your donation page to the homepage where, where every, you know, it's, it's the single highest traffic page on your website. Um, you know, I ran some numbers for this presentation. It kind of depends on the organization, but, you know, somewhere between 10 to 25% of your traffic in December is going to come through your homepage um, and see that homepage. So, um, you know, again, just making it easy for them uh, is the number one thing. And how e how much easier could it be than taking over your homepage and say, this is this is the opportunity that's in front of you and how many lives you can change if you were to make a gift today. Amazing. Cool. Well, thank you, Greg, so much for your time and for going a little bit longer talking about uh, some of these questions. I know uh, I appreciate your perspective again. I'm, I'm sure all of our viewers do as well because um, you're right there with them running all these campaigns. So, um, best of luck to you. Best of luck to all of you, our viewers, as you start to put some of these things into action. We're rooting for you throughout this season. Again, if we could be a resource for you, uh, we would love to be. Shoot me an email. Go check out those resources again at, uh, on our website. Uh, and best of luck to you. So we'll talk to you hopefully very shortly. Take care. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Thanks, Yeah, take care, Greg. <laughs>